Hey guys, what's up? It's me again, Tom from TTT Tom's Tech Time. Welcome to another episode about the tremendous DJI Mavic Pro. Today I want to be showing you the most cinematic settings for filming with the Mavic Pro. Let's get started right away, but before we jump into the settings, take a look at some test clips of mine that I recorded in Canada lately. Let's take a closer look at the main screen before we begin working on the settings. At the top, we find a gray bar that displays some of the most relevant information. We get to see the value of the ISO, the shutter speed, the EV, the white balance. Next to that we see a note that asks us to format our micro SD card for some weird reason. Actually the card is working perfectly and I don't know why that note appears. Next to that we find the leftover capacity of the card. And next to that we find an AF, MF, autofocus, manual, focus switch. And finally we get to see the icon for the auto exposure bracketing function. Having an overview of the settings is quite helpful and no worries if you don't understand the single functions or values yet, I'll be explaining it all. Before we can get started we need to toggle the mode switch on the display from the photography mode to the filming mode. The switch is located right above the shutter button. Now the aspect ratio changes and we're good to go. Tap at the icon right below the recording button to open up the camera settings menu. Now tap at the camera icon. The first submenu we want to focus on is the video size submenu. In here we find several video formats from 720p HD to 4K. Which one to choose? My recommendation is to always and at all times choose a video quality that is as high as possible, in this case 4K. There are two main reasons why you want to work with a super high resolution. First, 4K looks a lot sharper than 1080p, even on a non-4K screen. Next to that, even if you want to create a full HD film in post-production only, you should choose 4K as the extra pixels offer you the possibility of a lossless zoom you can crop in without losing quality, which is quite nice. Now which of the 4K formats should we be choosing? The one at the top is Cinema 4K. It's a little wider than the format below, which is Ultra HD. Cinema 4K creates black bars on most screens as it does not fit 16 to 9 monitors. It finally is up to you. I'm going to choose Ultra HD 3840 by 2160. And it not only fits normal 16 to 9 screens perfectly, but it offers more options when it comes to choosing the frame rate. And talking about the frame rate, we now get displayed two options. Either 24 frames per second, which is the cinema standard, or 30 frames per second. If you really know how to handle your gear, if you're able to move your drone smoothly, you should be choosing 24 frames per second to create the perfect cinematic look. 30 frames per second do look a little different than film, but the higher the frame rate, the easier the handling of the camera. With 24 frames per second enabled, fast movements can result in a stuttery look. A beginner might want to choose 30 frames per second for the first project, while most ambitious users should give 24 frames per second a go. Let's now check the next submenu, the video format submenu. Which format should we be working with, MP4 or MOV? You should know that both formats are containers for the actual film data only. There is no immediate change in quality when you choose one of the formats. Often, MOV files need more storage, which some people take as a proof for better quality, which in my eyes cannot be confirmed, I cannot notice um, a difference. What I have experienced though is the fact that MOV files seem to be working more fluid on Mac computers as the format was designed by Apple, and MP4 is the more stable container for video editing on Microsoft computers. As I am using a Mac for editing, I am therefore going to choose MOV. By the way, if you want to know what editing software and computers I'm using, feel free to check out tomstechtime.com gadgets. There you can find a list of must-have post pro and filmmaking gear and computers, programs and accessories might be interesting. Next off is NTSC and PAL. Both are regional encoding systems. While NTSC is the North American standard, PAL is used in Europe and most parts of the world. Choosing one is easy if you only know your location. But there are a few things to keep in mind. Let me switch over to PAL on that purpose. The camera restarts, which takes a couple of seconds.
Let's now head back to the video size submenu. When using PAL, we cannot choose between 24 and 30 frames per second anymore, but we only have 24 and 25 frames per second available. That is a difference to keep in mind, especially if you like the look of higher frame rates. Nevertheless, we have chosen 24 frames per second for a true cinematic experience. We don't have to focus on that issue too much. There is another issue that we should know about. If you are planning on filming indoors with electrical light turned on, or if you're planning on nighttime filming with the electrical street lights visible, you definitely need to make sure to choose the regional encoding system that fits your location as otherwise a bad and heavily visible flicker will ruin the look of your shots. But we'll talk about that later again. Let's now move on. What's next? The white balance. And contrary to expectation, the white balance, even though we could go ahead and colorize our footage with it easily, is not a creative tool. It's a technical tool for creating true colors. White needs to be looking white, black needs to be looking black, blue needs to be looking blue and so on. It is our goal to always set a correct white balance to reduce the amount of work and post-production and with a wrongly chosen white balance there can be a lot of work. Okay, couldn't we just use the auto white balance? Actually DJI's auto white balance is working pretty good compared to some of the competitors as Unique for example. But still DJI's auto white balance is not perfect. We could go ahead and always enter a value manually. The higher the value, the warmer the look of the footage. The lower the value, the colder and more bluish the look of the footage. Often manually setting a perfect white balance is a little tough as the precision gets lost as most of us only use a small phone for setting things up and the safest option is to simply choose a white balance from the list. During sunny days we want to choose sunny and during cloudy days as today we want to choose cloudy and so on. Please check the white balance before each flight and set it up once. And it's definitely worth it. All pictures will have the same neutral tint. Otherwise you might have shots from the very same location one looking a little warmer, another one looking a little colder and stitching those together in post-production often is a true pain. Let's now get a little creative. Let's open up the style submenu. In here we find three icons as there are from left to right, sharpness, contrast and saturation. To create a cinematic look we now want to bring all values down. Let's select the sharpness and bring it down to negative two. No worries, you're not at all lowering the quality of your footage, you're only reducing the amount of digital sharpness. And digital sharpness does not look very cinematic, it looks over sharpened and somewhat unnatural often. If though in post-production you're missing some extra sharpness, you can at all times apply a basic sharpness filter and bring the digital sharpness back up. I think almost every editing software features a basic digital sharpness tool. Next off is the contrast. We want to lower the value for a more precise workflow in post-production. If we bring it up too high, we would be losing all details in the over and under exposed areas. All gray tones would disappear and look black and all highlight tones would be looking like a white flat surface. The value that we now want to choose depends on the location. When I was filming in the desert in beautiful Israel lately, a value of negative one worked out fine. In more urban areas, a value of negative two works better due to all the differently lighted and colored areas that our camera has to illustrate. Finally, we want to work on the saturation. Again, I'm using a value of negative two. You won't really enrich the look of your plain footage right out of the camera, but if you only invest a couple of minutes of work in post-production, you will be glad that you set up your camera correctly. If you don't like the look and you cannot handle it, in post-production later on, you can simply apply a basic saturation and contrast tool, raise the values and you'll achieve a standard look again. I often leave all colors a little less saturated and only bring up the saturation of two complementary colors. I for example like bringing up the warmer orange tones and the colder bluish tones while not touching all other colors at all. That already creates a much nicer and more cinematic look. We now want to move on to the color submenu. In here we find several color profiles. Film A, Film B, Film C, Film D, Film E and so on. Even though some of them are looking nicer than others I highly recommend not using them at all uh, for a professional overall look of your footage. At the top we find the two rather professional color profiles, d -like and D-Log. Both of them flatten the look of the footage, again preserving many details that otherwise would be lost. And personally I'm a big fan of d -like. It not only is a lot easier to work on in post-production, but it in my eyes creates a somewhat cinematic look, not too less, not too much, it's just perfect. 
Let's now switch back and tap at the gear wheel icon at the top right for some extended settings. But before I cover them all, we want to go for a short break and we'll be back in 40 seconds. Welcome to the all new Tom's Tech Time website. Let me show you around. Dozens of how-to videos, reviews and comparisons are waiting for you. All categorized, all free, all ready to watch. At TomsTechTime.com, you're only one click away from our highly viewed segment, The Drone Film School. There you can find video lessons, buyer's guides and many filmmaking templates. Don't own a drone yet? Click the deals page and find the hottest offers on the web. And if you already have a drone, enhance its capabilities with the most highly recommended accessories for filmmaking, safety, and a better flying experience. TomsTechTime.com, teaching the world how to fly drones. Well, you really should check out my website, especially the Drone Film School segment is highly recommended for true cinematic aerials. It's all free, of course. But let's now get back into the settings. The luminosity histogram at first should be always enabled. What is a luminosity histogram? It basically shows the overall brightness of a scene. Check whether your footage is correctly under or overexposed with ease. You have to imagine that the histogram is split into three segments. At the very left we have the dark area. In the middle we find the midtones and at the very right we find the bright areas. Under normal circumstances it would be our goal to move all of the mountain like graphs into the midtone region. If too many of the little mountains are at the very right, the image is probably going to be overexposed and too bright, while if too many of the mountains are situated at the very left of the histogram, we know that the overall look of the footage will be too dark, probably heavily underexposed. This little tool is easy to handle and can be a true lifesaver. Always leave it turned on, as our tiny phone displays are not always accurate enough to really give us a sense of the lighting situation of a scene. Next, we want to enable the front LED's auto turn off. It basically means that when pressing the rec button, the Mavic Pro will automatically switch off its front LED's, which is especially useful when filming reflective surfaces as skyscrapers, glass of any kind and so on. Next, we find some irrelevant settings for filmmaking, basically leave them untouched. A word on the overexposure warning, in my forum on Facebook I've read several posts from people asking whether their camera sensor was broken or not as it was displaying some zebra looking like weird stripes. Nope, the sensor has nothing to do with those lines at all, gladly. The zebra appears if you have the overexposure warning enabled. It then displays the overexposed areas of an image. I think the histogram is more precise though and that's why I leave this function turned off always. Auto Sync HD Photo is irrelevant, Long Exposure Preview is irrelevant and the video caption, which saves some flight data with the footage, is irrelevant for filmmaking as well. Let's open up the grid submenu. We can choose between horizontal and vertical lines or the same lines plus two diagonal lines. I prefer choosing the basic grid lines for two reasons. First of all, you can easily check in flight whether the horizon of your gimbal is aligned correctly and secondly, you can take the lines as a reminder for some extra creative filming techniques as the rule of thirds for example, which basically tells us not to center an object of interest but to locate it at the position where the horizontal and the vertical lines meet, saying either a bit to the right or the left. You can really create more interesting shots if you keep that in mind. Next is the center point submenu. Personally, I leave the center points disabled as we already now have plenty elements and distraction on the screen. I only enable a center point when, for example, setting up a point of interest where the drone autonomously circles an object. It's sometimes tough hovering right above the center of the chosen obstacle for setting up the POI center point. I think a center point can be pretty helpful with that. Let's right now take a closer look at the anti-flicker submenu. What is it about? Do you remember our pal NTSC talk at the beginning of the video? Choosing the correct value will ensure a flicker-free workflow when filming electrical lights, as street lights or indoor lights. 50Hz is being used in Europe, while 60Hz is the North American standard. Please do not choose auto. I did that before and trust me, it didn't work out at all and I don't know why, but it ruined a couple of shots of mine. Choose the value that fits your location. Finally, let's bring up the file index mode. It basically lets you choose how the drone names your files. On reset, the drone names the files DJI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. You then remove the card from the drone, copy the files, put it back in place and the drone again starts naming the new files DJI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. To me, choosing continuous is a lot safer. You record some footage, again DJI 12345, you remove the card from the drone, copy the files, put it back in place. Now you again start recording 
and the drone starts with DJI 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. You that way ensure that you won't accidentally overwrite some files that uh, have the same name. Always choose continuous for safety purposes. Okay, we're almost done. Please tap at the aperture icon. Let me now show you how to set up your camera in flight as all the menus we've already covered besides the white balance submenu do not have to be changed before each flight. Okay, we do see the three different values, the ISO, the shutter and the EV. If you choose auto, you won't have to take care of anything, but of course your footage will not be having the final cinematic touch. Go ahead and choose manual. Let's start with setting up the ISO. The ISO is a tool that digitally brightens an image. You can set up a value between 100 and 3200. You need to know though that the higher the ISO's value, the more disturbing noise will be visible. For nighttime filming, I recommend a maximum ISO of 400 while the absolute pain threshold would be 800. Never dial in anything higher. The ideal value, of course, is 100, the lowest amount. The shutter speed influences not only the brightness of an image, but it really changes the look. The higher the shutter speed, the more crisp and clear the images will look like. The lower the shutter speed, the more blurry it would look. You do have seen blood splatter or water particles being filmed. Those were filmed with a high shutter speed. For normal cinematography, there is an easy way of finding out what value to choose. 2 times 24 makes 48. We choose the closest, 50. Only when filming some close to the object action as dirt biking or skiing or surfing for example, a higher value will be looking nicely. Okay, we now applied the perfect value for a cinematic result but the image looks too bright and in summer the screen often turns almost white. You can now bring the brightness down by bringing the shutter speed up again, but we didn't want to do that, right? So is there any way we can work with the perfect settings even in bright sunlight? Yes, the keyword is ND filter. It functions as a sunglass for your lens, it lets less light enter the camera and with the correct filter you can now put in the perfect values. I have listed the best working ND filters for the DJI Mavic Pro and many other drones on tomstechtime.com gadgets. Next with the most highly recommended accessories for filming and flying with the Mavic in general. The EV, to end this up, only displays whether a scenery is too dark or too bright again. If the value is negative, the image will be looking too dark. If it is positive, the image will be looking too bright. Zero would be the perfect value for the EV, but again my recommendation is to take a look at the histogram. Finally, let me show you another small tool. At the top we can choose either AF, autofocus or MF, manual focus. Usually and under normal circumstances we would be using AF where you only tap at a spot and the camera automatically focuses. But sometimes, for example, when working with a clear fore and background, you want to manually focus. You can turn the wheel to change the focus. But honestly, it's really hard to tell what is perfectly in focus on our tiny screens. Tap at the three dots at the upper right hand side to bring up the general settings menu. Now scroll down a bit and notice peak focus threshold and put in 90%. Red lines now mark the area that is sharpened in focus. And of course the red lines won't be recorded but only displayed on your mobile device while filming. 